Ah, Tristan, I just noticed that I didn't have my microphone on. How are you doing? Good, good. All right, well, I should probably uh, start from the beginning again because um, uh, the recording started just a few seconds ago, but I forgot to have the microphone on. So, um, so things are going well? Good stuff. And uh, is it pretty spring-like weather where you live right now? Oh, is that right, eh? Yeah, a little bit up and down, but I got to say I love it. I love this spring stuff. Um, so, hey, I'll just jump right into this. and. Um, we have started the recording already, but uh, I'll just kind of go over some stuff just uh, briefly again because we haven't gotten very far into it. And um, so anyone listening to this recording just wanted to mention it's really important to watch this right to the end um, because uh, I was looking at the test when I went over this. So again, this is on lessons four to six. And so Tristan, if you want to answer some of these questions, you can. Um, a lot of them I'm going to actually have the material right above where the question is, so you can answer them that way. Uh, don't feel like you have to answer all of them, but if you want to answer some of them, just to be you know, kind of testing yourself on this stuff, that would be cool. Okay, so first of all, we're going to go over these different processes involved in human reproduction. So we start with ovulation, go to fertilization, then implantation, and parturition. Now that's just a fancy name for childbirth. Okay, so just to review what each of them is, so ovulation is when the egg is produced, fertilization is when the egg, of course when the egg is fertilized by the sperm, and then in implantation is when the fertilized egg grows in the uterus. So first of all, when the zygote is formed, and that's when the egg and sperm meet, um, that is what is implanted in the uterus, and after that, that grows into the embryo and eventually into the fetus. And again, the last stage parturition is childbirth. So at this point, we just have a diagram that's uh, showing some different processes. And the question here says, which of the four processes above, so which of those four uh, names that we looked at in bold, which one do you think process Y is referring to? And so this should actually be talking about like two different cells meeting together to produce one cell. Okay? So that would actually be showing us um, fertilization, right? The egg and the sperm meeting together. Now the next question is kind of a thinking question, and what it is is, can you remember why sexual reproduction has advantages over asexual reproduction? Can you think of anything at the moment, Tristan? Okay, exactly. It makes different individuals, so we're, we're talking variation, right? Instead of an army of clones. That's a good way of saying it. And so, all right. So I wrote here, new gene combinations are produced since you get genes from mom and dad, they mix together. On the other hand, asexual reproduction techniques such as binary fission, where one bacteria cell splits into two, or one yeast cell forms a bud, forms a single bump on the outside of it, and then a new one grows out of it they produce cells that are identical, like you're saying. And because of that, we don't have any new gene combinations being produced. Okay. Uh, the next question here is, which structure does implantation occur in? And so, Tristan, I won't be, you know, stopping and waiting for each one of these just because it might slow us down a little bit. Um, so maybe some of them I'll, you know, if you can think of what the answer is immediately, maybe just type it out. and. Um, Otherwise, I'll just kind of review what these are. Okay, that sounds all right. And so, uh, so implantation again. We look at the fact that it occurs in the uterus, and the specific part of the uterus is the lining of the uterus, which is called the endometrium. 
Okay. And now to go in these blanks here, um, can you think of what would go in here? Which one of the asexual types of cell division takes place in bacteria and which takes place in yeast? Okay, so with bacteria, would you agree that it would be binary fission, right? And then with yeast, it was budding. Okay, does that make sense now? Okay, awesome. So what we're going to do at this point, uh, we talked about these different processes in human reproduction. Let's see if we can put them in order. Uh, so which one do you think is the first one? Do you think it's ovulation, fertilization, parturition, or implantation? Which one do you think happens first? Okay, so first ovulation happens, the egg is produced, and then what happens next? Which number? You have new nail. Okay, that's right. After that, it'd be fertilization, and then after that, so the egg is produced in ovulation, fertilized by the sperm. Right over here. After that, we have after the zygote is produced, right? Then it's implanted into the endometrium, and of course, the last one is going to be parturition, which is childbirth. Good stuff. Okay, so let's. Move on to the next one. Okay, so we're just going to go over a few of these here. Um, so some different parts of the male and female reproductive systems. Um, we won't go into all of this, but just know which three structures work together to produce semen, and that's going to be the seminal vesicles, the prostate gland, and the Cowper's gland. So that's going to be structures five, six, and seven. Okay, so just be able to label those and know those are the three structures that produce semen. Um, all right, so the next question says, if we were asked which structures above are most affected by secretions from the pituitary gland, that's right, exactly. And, and that's talking about the sperm as opposed to the semen, right? Just a little bit of a, a differentiation there. Okay. So. So the next question is talking about which structures above are most affected by secretions from the pituitary gland. So again, we know that the pituitary gland, the master gland, is producing a lot of the hormones that we think about. And so the different hormones that are involved in reproduction, reproduction um, are going to be affected by these hormones. Um, so the, the different organ, organs involved in reproduction are going to be affected by hormones produced by the pituitary gland. And so specifically in males, it's going to be testicles or testes. And in females, it's going to be the ovaries and the uterus. And we'll see later on which hormones are affecting those different structures. Okay, so on this diagram, it's going to be 9, 10, and 13. So again, in the male, testes is going to be affected. Uh, the female, we've got the uterus here, it's going to be affected, and the ovary as well. Okay, so those are the ones that are going to be affected by secretions or hormones from the pituitary gland. Okay, so. A sec here. So stop me at any point if you have any other questions. So the next question, number eight, says uh, which structure in males is where sperm are stored and where they mature? Now this one is um, maybe a little less obvious than some of the other structures we've talked about, but this is the epididymis. Okay, so here's how you spell it right here. The epididymis is right beside the testes, so it's this part right here. Okay, so that's where sperm are stored. Next question says, which structures in males and females have similar functions? Okay, and so the answer to this one, now the, the testes produce the sperm, like you were saying, right? The ovaries produce the eggs. So they've got kind of a similar function, right? So we would label, yeah, okay, I can see where you labeled the uh, epididymis there now. Um, so we would label on the diagram, if we had a question that was talking about this, you know, which 
uh, structures in male and females would be similar, we would label these ones, the testes and the ovaries. And then uh, if you look at the oviducts, those are tubes that carry the eggs from the ovaries. And so this would actually be this here. I know we can't see it very well in here, but there would be like a, a tube that's going to carry the eggs from the ovaries, and this would be the oviduct right here. Okay? And so the tube that carries the, the uh, sperm is going to be this right here, and that's called the vas deferens. Okay? So you can see how those two have kind of similar functions. Slightly different, but similar. All right. So the next question, question number 10 says, um, the vas deferens is a tube that, which takes sperm from where they are produced to the ejaculatory duct. Then the sperm will leave the male, and which tube will they leave from? Okay, so they're going to go from here to the ejaculatory duct, and then we're looking at this tube here. So what is that? Okay, that's going to be the urethra. Okay, so um, if, if somebody asks you, you know, a question having to do with a problem with the vas deferens, and why that would lead to infertility, well, it would be because, be because of the fact that the vas deferens is not able to take the sperm to the ejaculatory duct, and then from there to the urethra. Okay, so that would be the reason for infertility because of the problem with the vas deferens. Okay, so we'll just go on. And uh, at this point, we're talking about some more of those processes we looked at before. So first of all, you can see uh, in step one, you can see ovulation here, right? An egg has been produced by the ovary. Here you can see fertilization. So this part, again, is the fallopian tubes, and in this part here is where the egg had met up with the sperm. So we've got fertilization taking place right here. All right, so then after it's been fertilized, we've got the zygote. Yeah, <laughs> good. So the zygote travels here and is implanted. So here's the implantation, and that's into the endometrium. Now you've got this little structure here, this little circular structure. is called a blastocyst. Now what this does is it helps to break down the endometrium. So it allows that zygote that's just been formed to implant into there. So it dissolves part of the endometrium. Okay, so the blastocyst, that's its job, is allowing for implantation. Good stuff. Okay, so what's going to happen is after this zygote is implanted in here, the endometrium is going to thicken. So that's what happens is one of the first stages of pregnancy, that endometrium starts to thicken. Okay, so this whole thing here starts to thicken. Okay, so the plot thickens, as they would say in LA. Something like that. Sorry, that's a bio joke there. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's review at this point uh, a number of the different hormones that are involved in pregnancy. So, first of all, you've got you know, puberty happening at a certain point, and the hormones are produced in the hypothalamus. You might remember this is part of the brain. If we call the pituitary the master gland because it controls all these other glands, the hypothalamus is like the master of the master gland. Okay, so then we've got this stuff called LH, which stands for luteinizing hormone. And uh, we'll check out and see that it does, that's right. Um, so luteinizing hormone does something different with males and females. With females, uh, it assists in the development of the follicle. What's the follicle? That's the structure that produces the egg, right? And so, um, oh, but another thing about luteinizing hormone, it's very high just before ovulation, okay? So that's important to know. And um, so that's what happens in, the, in a female is LH is very high just before ovulation. And in a male, LH stimulates the production of testosterone, okay? So, the next hormone we're going to look at is FSH. I think we talked about this in another session before. If you remember that the F, if you could just kind of connect it with the word finishing, and finishing is like the word maturation, so it causes the maturation of the egg. That's what FSH does. Okay? And uh, the other two hormones are estrogen and pro pro progesterone. Um, and those hormones are, they continue to rise just before birth. Um, well, just before birth, they, in, they decrease, but all during pregnancy, they're, they're increasing. Okay? So when you think about uh, pregnancy, these are two of the major hormones involved. 
and estrogen actually controls progesterone levels. Now, progesterone is lowest at the time of ovulation. So if you think of progesterone as being the opposite of LH, LH is high just before ovulation, progesterone is low. Okay, so near the end of pregnancy, progesterone is going to decrease, and that's part of what stimulates childbirth when progesterone decreases. Okay, so what other jobs does progesterone have? It maintains the endometrium during pregnancy, and it stops the uterus from contracting. It keeps the fetus where it is. Now we'll see another hormone in just a second that does the opposite of stopping the uterus from contracting. All right, how about HCG? That stands for human chorionic gonadotropin. Well, that's produced up until eight weeks, and the job of this hormone is to maintain the corpus luteum. All right, that's kind of a funny word. We're going to go into that at this point. What is this corpus luteum? All right, well, what that is, it's a little structure. It's only produced during pregnancy. It doesn't exist any other time. But what it does, it produces the two important hormones that we looked at, estrogen and progesterone. Now, progesterone um, maintains um, pregnancy until the placenta is formed. So it might help to just think about that there's two P's. Okay, good stuff. So there's two different P's that are maintaining pregnancy. You have new name. So uh, progesterone does before the placenta takes over, and the placenta takes over at 12 weeks, and um, okay. So it looks like something else. Someone else. I'm sorry. Someone else will be uh, joining us in just a sec. So. Um, um, okay, so just remember that the placenta uh, maintains the preg pregnancy after 12 weeks. It takes over from progesterone. Okay, so um, now we're going to talk about oxytocin. Remember I told you that uh, progesterone kind of works against the contraction of the uterus? Well, oxytocin causes the contraction of the uterus during labor. Okay, so that's how labor occurs, right? And it is, uh, remember, the uterus is the smooth muscles that contract, right? It's, it's the smooth muscles. Okay. The other thing that oxytocin does is it releases milk during breastfeeding. And we're going to look at, in a sec, another hormone that works together with oxytocin. Oxytocin releases milk, and we'll look at the hormone that produces milk. Okay, so if I asked you here which structure uh, would be the one that's the uterus, and you looked on here, if you knew that it was the thick muscular wall, then you would know that it's going to be structure two, right? Because you can see that it's actually pointing to the wall. So that's structure two. So that would be the uterus. Okay. So moving along here, uh, we're just going to look at the different steps that are involved in uh, breastfeeding. So what happens is uh, when, the, when the baby uh, suckles on the mom's breast, that actually kind of turns on a series of steps. So, of course, somehow that message is going to cause some hormones to be produced, and the brain has to be what's producing those hormones, but somehow the message has to get from the mom's breast to the brain, right? So it stimulates nerves that lead from the mom's breast to the hypothalamus of the brain, and then the hormone oxytocin is released, and then oxytocin, as we saw earlier, causes milk to be released. Okay, so that's kind of the series of steps that happen. And I told you before that there's a, a hormone that goes hand in hand with oxytocin. Oxytocin causes hormones, uh, milk rather, to be released. Prolactin causes milk to be produced in the first place. And the way I kind of think of this, I don't know if you've ever uh, come across anyone who is lactose intolerant before. Are you familiar with that term, lactose intolerance? Okay, there you go. So you know that your sister has a trouble with milk sugar, right? And uh, certain people have more of that. Um, for some reason, Oriental people, I believe, are a little bit more prone to um, having lactose intolerance, right? But if you think about the fact that lactose is milk sugar, think of the word prolactin. Think of lactose being milk and pro as being production. So that will kind of help you remember that prolactin is involved in milk production. Okay. Yeah, I can imagine that's a bit of a um, a bit of a thing to deal with, eh? Some of these types of allergies and stuff. Okay. Interesting. 
right, so let's say we were looking at this question here, right? This question here says what point on the diagram is best matched with the correct event? Yeah, um, these allergies can be quite something. And we were thinking my son was allergic to wheat. Um, well, we were thinking he had, or actually not wheat, but the stuff that's in it, this gluten, you know, um, uh, celiac disease. He w it was totally looking like he had that, but then it turned out that he, he wasn't, so we were pretty th thankful for that. Um, but hey, so looking at this diagram here, this is saying which diagram, which point in the diagram is best matched with the correct event. I won't go into all of this right now, but this one should be um, LH levels being high corresponds with step number one, ovulation. So you remember that before? At the point of ovulation, LH was high and progesterone was low, right? Okay. So going on to the next one, um, I think we're just going to, at this point, uh, do a little bit of a check on some of these things we've looked at so far. So I do have the answers here. And, you know, see if you can write the answer even without me saying it. I'm just going to do a quick check and see. Okay. Sorry, I'll be back in just a sec. Sorry about that. Just have to type a quick email. Okay. Um, yeah, that's right. Progesterone gets high during pregnancy, just like estrogen. Okay. So, um, so again, these questions here, you can look at the stuff that's on here if you want, and. Um, that's, you know, if you know what the answer is without looking, that's, that's good too. So the next question says, which hormone produces the gr or promotes the growth and development of an egg or an ovum? That's another word for egg, right? Okay. So that one would be FSH because the growth and development of an egg is just kind of another word of saying the, the maturing of the egg. And we said that the F stands for finishing or maturing, right? Okay, question 13, which structure digests the endometrium so an egg can plant into it, can implant into it? Okay, that was, that was the blastocyst. Sorry, I saw you were typing there. Does that, does that sound right? Is that little circular structure, the blastocyst, and that little thing was uh, dissolving the endometrium, right? Okay. Now, which hormone helps to maintain the corpus luteum? Do you remember which one that was? Okay, I will just uh, show you that again. So where are we on? All right, so that was this little structure here. Right, that's the corpus luteum. It's the temporary structure. And remember we said it was this HCG that has the job of maintaining the corpus luteum. Okay, so... Oh, just a sec. Wrong page. Okay, so question 15 says, why are healthy functioning ovaries important to the health of a fetus before 12 weeks but not after 12 weeks? That's right, the corpus luteum is only present during pregnancy. It's just a temporary structure. Hey Mary, how's it going? Well, that's good. All things are going well, thanks. Uh, still having lots of adventures with my little uh, puppy dog. Little uh, beagle, beagle pup. I don't know what it is. Uh, recently she's um, been barking a lot. And uh, 
we, I gotta say, we're kind of wondering if maybe she's in heat. So it kind of relates a little bit to the topic we're talking about today. Oh, we lost Tristan. Uh, hopefully you can get back on there. Oh, he's back. Hey, Tristan. But, um, yeah, uh, it was great to see you guys at the, uh, the water park on Friday. Okay, so what we're looking at here is uh, we're looking at this question. Oh, is that right, eh? That's too bad. We're glad you were able to get back on. Okay, so question 15 says, why are healthy, healthy functioning ovaries important to the health of a fetus before 12 weeks but not after 12 weeks? Um, so Mary, I just uh, mentioned to Tristan earlier that a lot of these questions I've actually written the answer afterwards because that way you can look at the answer, you can see what it is, and um, you know, if you want to, even if you see what the answer is there, you can type it out. Um, but it doesn't hurt, you know, that way it just kind of imprints into your brain a little bit more. Okay, so the reason is, um, the reason why healthy functioning ovaries are important to the health of the fetus before 12 weeks, but not so much after 12 weeks. After 12 weeks, we saw that the placenta takes over, and, you know, and, and it, it is what sustains the pregnancy at that point. Okay, so um, healthy functioning ovaries are not as important after the 12-week period because the job is taken over by the placenta. Okay, so question number 16 says, what is the role of LH in males and females? And um, again, if you, if you do know what it is, just you know, whip it out there. And otherwise, I'll just go over it because we've got a lot of these questions here. Okay, well, well, LH in males, uh, something kind of similar, uh, it promotes testosterone production, right? And remember, in ovulation, LH levels are high just before ovulation, and remember, progesterone levels are low, okay? So it's going to be, it's going to have to do with ovulation, the start of ovulation, LH, okay? So uh, question 17, which hormone is high and which is low at the time of ovulation? Okay, so let's see if you guys know this because we just kind of touched on this a bit. Which one is high at the time of ovulation? Okay, that's going to be LH. And do you remember which one is low? Progesterone. Exactly. Good stuff. Okay, so... Uh, we looked at two hormones that, uh, and, and I realize you weren't here, Mary, um, two of them relate to milk. One of them relates to milk production and the other one milk being released. Um, Tristan, do you remember which one relates to milk production? There was a way that uh, we can remember this one. You remember you were talking about um, something with your, your sister having a certain kind of uh, allergy type thing? Okay, lactose intolerance, that's right. And so um, prolactin, uh, and we look at the fact that we kind of associate milk with lactose sugar that's in it. So if you think about milk being lactose, and you look at the word prolactin, and you look at the pro meaning produce, okay, so the prolactin is responsible for milk being produced. And then the other hormone that causes milk to be released, that one was oxytocin. Okay, so remember that uh, oxytocin and prolactin go a little bit hand in hand that way. Okay, so we're going to look at this point about the sequence of events um, during breastfeeding. Um, can anyone tell me which would be the first action here that would take place? One, two, three, or four? Okay, good. So the uh, baby's going to suckle on the mom's breast and that's going to do what? Okay, and uh, so after number three comes, somehow that message has to get, that message has to get to the brain, right? Because we want some 
hormones to be produced. So, so it's going to be number four. The nerves are going to carry that message from the mom's breast to the brain, right? And, uh, and in the brain, uh, we're going to have the message, you know, the um, pituitary gland is going to cause the release of oxytocin, right? And that's going to be the next step, which is then going to cause the release of milk, okay? So um, question number 19 says, what are the two roles of oxytocin? And so we talked just a second ago that it's the release of milk, not the production. That was prolactin. It's going to be the release of milk. It's also the contraction of the uterus. And again, we looked at the fact that progesterone is the opposite. It's, it inhibits the uh, contraction of the uterus. Okay? So question number 20 says, which two hormones are most high during pregnancy? And if you give these two hormones to a woman, it will mimic pregnancy. And those two hormones are estrogen and progesterone. Okay, those are kind of the most two major female hormones, you could say. All right, so we'll go on to the next page. And I know there's a whole ton of stuff here. So question 21 says, which female structure must be functioning well in order for fertilization to occur? Any ideas on that? I know the answer is right there, and that's okay. Again, you can you can just type it out if you if you want to, um, but again, it's just you know a chance to kind of imprint it in your brain. Um, <laughs> yep. So it, okay, so it's going to be ovaries, right? The ovaries. Uh, that's how we're going to have ovulation being taking place, production of the egg, right? So. Uh, hmm. Sorry, guys, I just heard the doorbell. I'm just going to wait a second, see if my wife's here. And if not, I'll get that. Um, okay, so just know where to find that on the diagram we looked at earlier, the ovaries. Okay, so which organ secretes hormones that begin puberty? And again, that was the hypothalamus, that part of the brain, again, the master of the master glands, master of the pituitary. Question 23 says, um, when will the endometrium thicken? Okay, so there's two conditions. First one is you've got a fertilized egg, you've got a zygote implanted there, um, and the second one is um, when progesterone levels are high. Okay, so we're going to look at this point about uh, at some of these uh, kind of weird words, haploid and diploid, and what do they mean? Okay, well haploid, um, if you want to just kind of make a mental association with the word half, okay, we'll see later on it kind of kind of means that. Um, so haploid cells are the sex cells or gametes, so the egg or sperm. Diploid are regular body cells, and there's a, a fancy word you might come across, it's somatic. That's just another word for regular body cells, and gametes are the sex cells. Exactly, eh? Just, uh, just to throw a curveball your way, eh? That's why they do it, just to keep you on your toes. Um, okay, so haploid is we, we call that 1N. If you ever see 1N, that means haploid, right? Okay, and so you'll have half the DNA or half the chromo chromosomes of the diploid cell. So diploid is 2N. So if we're talking about how many cells are in a human, or how many chromosomes are in a human cell, we have 46. And then in the sex cells, which are haploid cells, we have 23. And so I just had a question here, which process produces gametes which have half the DNA by the end of it? And that's going to be meiosis. Because you remember with mitosis, you're producing cells that are identical to the parent cell. They have the same amount of DNA. Meiosis, you're going to produce cells that have half the DNA. And you actually have four cells produced during meiosis from one parent cell. OK, question 25 says, when two gametes join together, they form blank, the structure that begins life. All right, so that's a good old zygote. And so you can see here that the egg and sperm together form a zygote. You can see that these egg and sperm, they're haploid or 1N, and the zygote is diploid or 2N. So that's just kind of putting together all these terms we were talking about just recently. So what's going to happen is the zygote is going to divide over and over again until it forms the embryo and finally a fetus. And so if you had a question that was asking, well, what process is involved in those cell divisions from the zygote to the fetus, that's mitosis, right? 
All right, so um, you know, different animal cells have different amounts of chromosomes, right? So let's say we're looking at these different animals here. How many chromosomes do you think a sperm cell or an egg cell of a horse would contain based on the information in the chart? You're close. It's going to be half. This is, this is actually, yeah, it's going to be 66 divided by 2, right? Okay, so it's going to be 33. And so if you were asked the question about, you know, a somatic cell, again, that's a regular cell, so the answer would be 66. Okay, so we're going to look briefly, like really briefly, at the different stages of mitosis. Um, I don't know, did you guys ever learn this before, this uh, acronym, I point my arm towards Canada? Okay, it looked like a 60. That's understandable. <laughs> okay, well, that can help us remember the different stages in mitosis, okay? So I, interphase, P, prophase, you get the idea, right? So that can help you remember the different stages, all right? Especially during this uh, Olympics here, you know, all this pride, got to love that. So um, did you watch much of the Olympics? Yeah, totally, 14 goals. Got to love that, eh? Yeah, I think uh, you could say the whole lot of the world was pointing their arm towards this because uh, it sounds like there was more people watching it than, than I think just about any other Winter Olympics. So, um, okay, so interphase, that's the first stage. So I'm just going to, again, briefly highlight some of the more important things. So the DNA is not actually in chromosomes at this point. It's in a kind of a, a loose structure. Uh, sorry, I mean, it's actually a dense structure, I should say, because it's really compacted, uh, which is chromatin. <laughs> like the word A. Who's that who likes the word A? Just Canadians? Okay, so, okay. Yeah, no doubt. You have new mail. Um, so, okay, so the next st uh, phase is going to be prophase. You can see the DNA is going to shorten and condense to form chromosomes. Okay, so I think I was right in the beginning. In the beginning, the DNA is more loose. So it does condense at this point to form chromosomes. I just got tricked by the fact that it looked more condensed. Anyways, okay, so the DNA is going to condense uh, and shorten to form chromosomes at this point. This is actually where the DNA doubles as well in prophase. Okay, metaphase, if you just think M, middle, kind of, uh, you know, the chromosomes line up in the middle at this point. Um, the next stage, they're going to separate to the two sides of the cell. And these are known as sister chromatids. Okay, we'll talk about that in a bit. Okay, so that's anaphase. And... Okay, telophase, the new membrane forms around the separated chromosomes. And then the point where the two cells actually split is going to be cytokinesis. All right, so remember that since the parent cells and daughter cells have the same, remember they have the same amount of DNA in mitosis, and that's not the case in meiosis, right? So what's going on overall in mitosis, the DNA, you start off with a certain amount, and then it's going to double at one point, that's in prophase, but then later on, because you've got a cell division, the DNA is halved again, and so you've got the original level of DNA at the end. Okay? So let's also compare mitosis and meiosis in two different areas. One is the number of replications of DNA, so how many times DNA doubles itself. The other is how many cell divisions there are in mitosis and meiosis. Okay, so in mitosis, you have one replication of DNA or chromosomes, and you have one division of cells. Okay, before I go on to meiosis, just remember that anytime you talk about any question where there's any type of growth or cell repair, so you can tell that there's some sort of growth or cell repair taking place, you know it's going to be mitosis, not meiosis that's, that's involved. Okay, so now let's look at meiosis. So, well, first of all, this is still mitosis here, and uh, I just 
I just wanted to show you another diagram of it, and this one actually talks about uh, the chromosomes doubling at prophase. Okay, so um, so this one's not adding too much. We're just going to go on. Okay, looking at my oocyst then, so you've got your parent cell, and your overall result is going to be four daughter cells, and each one of them is going to have half the DNA of the parent cell. But you'll notice you have two cell divisions. You have one here and another here. With mitosis, we only add one cell division. But we only have one DNA replication. So that's a similarity to mitosis. Okay, so overall we're producing four daughter cells. Each has half the DNA of the parent cell. Okay, so if we were to compare mitosis and meiosis in terms of the amount of DNA in the daughter cells compared to the parent cells, what do you think? What would you say? How are they different in terms of how their daughter cell compares to the parent cell? Okay, would you say that with meiosis, the daughter cells have half the DNA of the parent, whereas mitosis, oh, sorry, it looks like Tristan was writing on something. Okay, so in asexual, it's the same, and in asexual, or which mitosis is, uh, you could say, a type of asexual, um, the cells are going to have the same amount of DNA as the, as the original parent cell, whereas they have half the amount of DNA in meiosis, right? How about the number of times DNA is duplicated or replicated, replication of chromosomes? Is that the same with mitosis and meiosis, or is that different? Okay, it's going to be the same. They both have only one replication of DNA. But there's a difference in the number of cell divisions. Can you guys remember what that is between mitosis and meiosis? What do you think? Okay, mitosis is sexual, and meiosis, uh, mitosis is asexual, and meiosis is, um, okay, so it should be mitosis is asexual, and meiosis is sexual, right? Um, and as far as the number of cell divisions, okay, as far as the number of cell divisions, you have two cell divisions, you can see that here with meiosis, right? And you remember how many cell divisions we had with mitosis? It was just one, right? Okay, so that's the difference. Okay, so next question. Um, okay, so we just got the answers here. So now we're going to look at a question here. It says there's four events that occur both in asexual and in sexual uh, cell reproduction. So it says human, so we know that you know this isn't going to be like binary fission or something like that because that's bacteria. That's sort of asexual reproduction. This must be referring to mitosis, just like Tristan was saying. Um, asexual is mitosis and sexual is meiosis, right? That's what this must be referring to. So it says four events that occur in both of them. Well, I'll give you a hint. Um, for this one here, there's two events that are different. In other words, there's two events here that occur in only uh, mitosis or meiosis, like either or. They don't occur in both. And if you can find those two, then um, the other ones are the ones that occur in both. Well, if we're looking through these, this one says identical cells are produced. 
can you guys think of a process, is it meiosis or mitosis, where identical cells are not produced, like the parent cells are not identical to the uh, daughter cells? That's right, that's going to be meiosis. Okay, so here's one that would not be in both processes, so we know we're going to eliminate three. The other one says haploid cells are produced. Remember, haploid cells are ones that have half the amount of DNA, right? So those are like 1N instead of 2N. So that's only going to happen in meiosis, not in mitosis, right? So 3 and 5 are not going to happen. The other ones, um, the centromeres divide, those are the things that just connect the two, like a little uh, piece of chromatin together, chromosomes together. Uh, cytokinesis, that's a splitting of the cells that occurs in both, right? DNA is replicated both. Spindle fibers form. That's, that they cause the separation of the chromosomes, okay? So everything other than the two of these is going to occur in both of them, both processes. All right. So uh, we're going to look at this point about something called non-disjunction. I just noticed that Tristan was typing there. Okay. Uh, so Tristan, you were wanting to just go over which the two were that are not involved in both mitosis and meiosis? Okay. So, so first of all, the, the idea of identical cells being produced, that is not going to occur in both mitosis and meiosis because we know that meiosis produces daughter cells that are different than the parent cells, and also haploid cells being produced. Again, haploid are those 1N cells or the gametes, and that only takes place in meiosis. In mitosis, you have 2N cells you start with and you end up with 2N cells, right? Okay? So all the other ones, they take place in both those two processes. Okay, so at this point we're talking about this process called non-disjunction. That's the failure of chromosome pairs to separate properly during cell division. Now this can take place either during mitosis or meiosis. And what happens when this occurs? Well, we can either get an extra chromosome. Okay, remember normal chromosome, uh, 2N stands for, you know, 46 chromosomes. If you got an extra chromosome, that's trisomy. All right? And if you've got a missing chromosome, that's monosomy. So in this situation, we've got one more. So instead of 46, we've got 47 chromosomes. And in this situation, we've got one less. So instead of 46, we've got 45. Okay? So, and we'll look at later uh, trisomy 21. That's kind of a special sort of trisomy. That's what we know commonly as Down syndrome. All right? So, Going on to the next question, um, okay, so this is kind of a review of what we've looked at. Uh, so I just wrote here, what expression will we use to show trisomy? Okay, that's going to be 2n plus 1, monosomy, 2n minus 1. Okay, so there's a, another kind of a disease, and it's called Klinefelter syndrome. It occurs in males, uh, and instead of getting the normal XY, you've got an XXY. So you're getting an extra X chromosome. And we'll look later on at, um, you know, at what causes that exactly. Okay, so you can see on this uh, pattern, this is showing the chromosomes of a male here, you can see that there's an extra X chromosome here. Okay, so instead of just having one, you can see two here, right? Now, how does this happen? How do you get Klinefelter syndrome? Well, it's when non-disjunction occurs in either the egg or the sperm, and the formation of either one, that can cause this to occur, this extra X chromosome. So the formation of egg or sperm is called gametogenesis, right? The genesis or birth of gametes, if you want to look at it that way. A little bit more Latin for you there. Okay. So going on to the next page. Uh, so just uh, again, gametogenesis is the production of gametes, egg or sperm. This takes place, of course, in the reproductive organs. Uh, so if you're looking at spermatogenesis, we're going to look at that in just a, a question in just a sec. That's a special type of gametogenesis, because, so that's one type of it. Uh, the, other, the other type would be uh, oogenesis, is the production of an egg. Uh, sure, Mary, go ahead.
Yeah, totally, eh? Like you said, the book of Genesis, the beginning, the sperm's beginning of life. Hey, that and that kind of thing would totally help you to remember, wouldn't it, eh? That's that's awesome. That's just the kind of stuff that can help you remember these kind of concepts. Especially when you have so many different kind of science words, eh? Yeah, thanks for sharing that. That's cool. All right, so the next question here says, how does the amount of DNA after gametogenesis and, you know, for example, spermatogenesis, how does it compare to the amount of DNA you have in a regular um, somatic cell? Well, in uh, 46 chromosomes you would have in a regular cell and you would have 23 in the gametes, right? Okay, so after the process of gametogenesis you would have uh, 23 chromosomes. All right, so here's a bit of a different question. How much DNA would you have, would the gametes have, if non-disjunction occurred during gametogenesis? Okay, well we know that if, uh, the, if the chromosomes are failing to separate and we're getting an extra one in one of the gametes, that means we're going to have to have one of the gametes having one less. Okay, so half the gametes are going to have like 22 chromosomes instead of 23 and half are going to have 24 instead of 23. Okay, so that's what's going to happen if you have non-disjunction in these um, during gametogenesis. Okay, so um, what this is uh, showing us here, this diagram, is showing us the DNA content of the nucleus. Okay, so as we're having different processes like, um, in this case, mitosis happening, you know, what's going to happen to the DNA content? That's all this is showing here, the amount of DNA. So um, the question here says, how would you describe what is happening in the section above segment KL? Well, if we look at this, uh, this is about, let's say, 7, and this is about 14. So we would say that the DNA is replicating during that period, right? Okay, so if we were asked a question about that during section KL, we'd say that DNA replication is taking place, right? All right, I think we've got another question about that chart, so let's check it out. Um, this question says, which stage of mitosis is likely completed at stage N? Okay, so stage N, we can see that we used to have about 14 as far as the amount of DNA. Now we've got about 7, so it's gone in half. And um, earlier when we looked at the different parts of mitosis, we saw that telophase was the part where the... Uh, nuclear, the new membrane, the new cell membrane forms around each of the new, the two new cells. So at that point, we've kind of divided the DNA in half. Even though the cells actually haven't split yet, they actually split at cytokinesis. At telophase, telophase is when um, the DNA content is going to be in half. Okay? So we would say that this is going to be telophase at this point. Okay. Uh, so we talked about this Klinefelter syndrome, and the question I just had here is what is it and what leads to it? Okay, so again, it's when you have 47 chromosomes and you've got an extra X chromosome, so you've got X, XY instead of XY, and it, it's caused by non-disjunction when you have the formation of the egg or the sperm. And I just noticed Tristan was typing something there. And uh, I just wanted to point out that when you have a chart like this, uh, this is called a karyotype. So a karyotype shows the specific uh, chromosomes that a certain person has. Um, the features of Klinefelter syndrome. Okay, so the features of Klinefelter syndrome have to do with um, male and female uh, features. And... Um, um, I probably, I don't know if I should go into that at this point, but I'll show you where you can find it. Just because it's 3 o'clock and we're on page 21. Uh, but basically, um, it just has to do with uh, the specific, uh, you could say, secondary sex characteristics of male and females. So if you just check out Kleinfelter's, I'm pretty sure it's in the index, and it will list the specific um, secondary sex characteristics. Okay. So, um, yeah, so just check out that and um, just to see exactly what, what it is. 
because honestly I can't remember exactly what the specific ways are that it affects, but I know that it has to do with also the uh, secondary sex characteristics. Okay? So, question number 38 says, does the karyotype above show an extra autosome or an extra sex chromosome? Okay, so we'll just look at it again. So, what do you guys think? When you look at that chart right over here, this karyotype, do you see an extra autosome or do you see an extra sex chromosome? Okay, here you can see an extra autosome, right? You can see three of them. Okay, so um, now the next question says, what process would have led to this extra chromosome? And that would have been non-disjunction, right? And it's during gametogenesis, so the formation of the egg or the sperm. All right, next question. It says, which expression of chromosome content represents um, somatic cells in people with trisomy disorders? And we saw that trisomy is when you have 2n plus 1, right? You've got one more chromosome, whereas monosomy would be 2n minus 1, because 2n is just the 46. Okay. So, just give me a sec here. Just need to stay on the school. Okay, next question says, if a plant that was 4n, okay, so normally we're looking at things that are 2n, right, when we're talking with humans, but let's say with some plants, uh, they're called like tetrapoidy or something like that, um, if it would be 4n instead of 2n. So if that kind of plant was crossed with a plant that was 6n, their offspring would be actually 3n, which is halfway in between, right? Okay, so... Um, I want to talk to you just briefly about something called sister chromatids, and we're going to look at how they're different from something called homologous chromosomes. So, uh, during mitosis, we have these sister chromatids. Okay, that's these guys here. And these two chromosomes are identical. They're identical copies of one chromosome, and they're connected together at this point here, the centromere. Okay? And later on, they get divided. Okay, so these are sister chromatids. They're identical, and they take place in mitosis. Now, uh, in meiosis, we've got a different story. In meiosis, uh, we've got two different copies of the same chromosome, one from each parent. And so here's homologous chromosomes. And so um, with homologous chromosomes, we usually, usually represent them by two different colors, whereas sister chromatids we represent them as having the same color, okay? Um, so if you look at the next question that we have, next question here says, okay, so if this was our diagram, it says the diagram of the cellular structure up above, which do you think it would be? And I'll give you a hint, it's, it's either two homologous chromosomes or two sister chromatids. Which one do you think it would be based on well, based on the color, what do you think? That's right. That's going to be two sister chromatids because they both have the same color. And if they had different color, then it would be two homologous chromosomes. Okay. Good stuff. So, uh, we're just going to talk here about the difference between identical twins and fraternal twins. So, with identical twins, you've got one egg being fertilized. And it's going to split, because first of all, okay, so here's our zygote. And normally that zygote would just produce an embryo, one embryo. But in this situation, one zygote, one fertilized egg, produces two different embryos. And that's how we get identical twins. So we only have one fertilized egg going on. Whereas fraternal twins, that are not identical, you've got two different eggs being fertilized by different sperm. Okay? And so each one of those produces a different zygote. And that's why these are dizygotic, two zygotes, and this is mono, mono, meaning one. Okay? And another difference, of course, identical twins, they share the same placenta, whereas we have di different placentas for fraternal twins. So, 
Now this is just showing a diagram of uh, you know what's happening to produce fraternal twins or sorry identical twins I should say. So going on to the next page, um, this is something that's important to note. For the most part, almost all the time, identical twins are going to be of the same gender. Okay, they form a zygote that contains either XX or XY chromosomes. There's a few exceptions to the rule, but it's almost always going to be the case that identical twins are going to be the same gender. All right. So um, at this point, we're just uh, we're going to talk in a second about um, follicles a little bit more. So a follicle is just the uh, collection of egg cells that contains the egg inside. That whole thing is the follicle, All right? So um, if you look at this diagram, uh, it's showing. Okay, so it says this shows the sequence of events in the development of a follicle in one reproductive cycle of a non-pregnant female. Okay, so uh, at stage four, where we have this egg being produced, how many chromosomes would be in the cell at this point? Talking a human cell, how many chromosomes would we have? Remember, we would have one end when either an egg or sperm is produced, so that's going to be 23 chromosomes. And if it was a regular cell, it would be 46, right? Okay. Um, so, what causes the formation of twins or triplets? How would you guys describe that? What causes the formation of twins or triplets? Uh, let's let's say we're assuming we're talking about identical twins. Okay, that's right. So a zygote is going to split into two different embryos. And uh, what would the uh, how would you describe the gender of identical twins? They're going to be the same. Good stuff. All right, and that might actually be the end. It is good stuff. You guys survived. That was a lot of stuff, I know. Um, so I'll just wrap it up at this point, guys. And uh, just wanted to encourage you guys to go over this again and again, uh, so you really know this stuff well. Again, I really tried to make a lot of the stuff that was on the test on this uh, whiteboard session. Uh, so again, you know, quiz yourself on the questions that are there. Um, also, <clears throat> anyone watching the recording will notice that the very beginning of the recording, I forgot to press the sound. So just the first probably minute or two. <coughs> Excuse me, there's no sound on the recording, uh, but then it kicks in after that. So I will wrap things up and I uh, hope the test goes awesome for you guys.